All right. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker. She creates many of Zillow's real estate indices and metrics, including the buyer-seller index and the buy-rent break-even horizon. This provides her a very unique perspective on economics, including whether or not we should or, or should be concerned, I guess, with another housing bubble. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Skyler Olson, Senior Economist with Zillow Group. All right. Um, hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, I spend a lot of time in front of my computer looking at data, uh, and so this is one of my most favorite parts of my job, is coming out and talking to real people. Um, <laughs> computers aren't real, really. Um, so it's really great to get out here uh, and, and dig in. So let's, let's dig in a little bit with data and, and let's look at some things. Now you guys, as boots on the ground, as close, heartfelt participants in the housing market, know this better than most, this crazy roller coaster ride uh, that we've been on over the past uh, several years. Now, you guys know this, but I want to, to uh, pay attention. Whoops, sorry, I'm just pushing things a little bit. Oh no, we're good. Um, I want you to pay attention to something a little bit odd and special about this. So, the recovery took a while, but home values appreciated rather quickly, right? Starved inventory at the same time we had investor activity meant home values were moving rapidly out of the trough, okay? They are currently now more expensive nationally than they have ever been. We have gone beyond pre-recession peaks in terms of home values. Not only that, but when we look at how home values are changing over time, if I look at a year-over-year -year measure of median home value across the U.S., this is this blue line in front of me, Home values are also moving at a pace that we have not seen since we were moving into the first bubble in the first place, okay? So now home values are moving at around 7%. Uh, we just released recent numbers. It's come down a little bit uh, to 6.8, but still very fast, rapid appreciation. This is at the national level. Normally we would say normal. It's 3 to 5%, okay? Above that is unsustainable. It's still very, very fast, okay? Now if I dig down into particular markets, things get even crazier. Okay. Let's say I go to the Pacific Northwest and I go to Seattle. Home values are appreciating at almost 13% year over year. Okay. In northern uh, Florida, they're close to 10%. Tampa and Orlando, 9.6, 9.1. Or Portland, Oregon, also very fast, 8.7. Okay. Minneapolis, 7.8. Okay, there are major metropolitan areas, the job centers, uh, places that are attractive to retirees, lots of population growth, in areas you know, that, where jobs are growing, not just uh, jobs in general, but high paying jobs in tech and finance fields. This is putting a lot of pressure, okay, a lot of pressure. And where's the pressure coming from? All right. Now, a lot of people think that the millennials are the perma-renters. Right? Make them out to the, they're permanently rent, they don't want to buy homes. That's phooey, okay, that's bollocks. Right? We do massive surveys, we do this every six months. We ask questions like, the one on the far right is my favorite, is owning a home necessary to live the good life and the American dream? Millennials say yes to this question far more often than older generations, Gen X and boomers. Okay? Owning a home increases your standing in the local community. Owning a home is key to higher social status. Yes, we have very positive sentiments towards home ownership. Okay? So what gives? Well, you're delayed, right? Millennials are very delayed. They're putting off all sorts of major life events that lead to home ownership. They're, getting, they're putting off getting married, and they're putting off having kids. Okay, they're doing it much later in life. The graph in front of you see here, that bottom line, that's the home ownership rate of a 23 to 34-year-old. Okay, the purple line, this is the percent with children. Okay, the green line, this is the percent every marri ever married. All of them steadily going down over time. Okay, now, I just made for you what economists call a spurious argument. I showed you some time series that appear to be moving together. Okay. Turns out I could have showed you murder rates and ice cream sales, and those move together too. <laughs> Turns out that's because we like to murder people in the summer. <laughs> so let's make a better argument real quick. Okay. Real quick, let's make a better argument. Everything you see in front of you is a homeownership rate of a 23 to 34-year-old okay, over time. Right? So this was the same age bracket you know, through the through the years, okay? The line in the middle, that uh, magenta color, this is the same line that we saw in the previous graph. This is the home ownership rate of just young 23 to 34 year olds in general, okay? All right, if I look at the right, 
This is all single people, broken down by whether or not they're a full-time, part-time, or non-worker. Notice all three of those graphs are not decreasing steadily over time. Okay? You're more likely now to own a home as a single person than you used to be in this age group. Okay, here's the delay. I go from those lines to boom, up to the top to married. You get married, you go buy a home, right? Well, or you think about it, you know. Depends if you're able to save for the down payment with high rent payments, high student loan debts, right? But boy, you're trying. Okay, so boom, up to married. Those top two lines that are pretty steady across the time, you can see the housing bubble there, but otherwise, overall trend, steady, okay? A lot of this has to do with the fact just that uh, these are both workers, right? Both partners work, steady over time, not decreasing. You're just as likely not to own a home in this age group than you used to be if you're married, okay? The ones that are going down over time are single earner families, okay? It's really hard to save for that down payment as a single earning family, okay? Now when we think, let's think long term, right? Let's think what's happening when we're talking about where all this pressure on home values is coming from. Well, it's coming from the fact that they're getting to these major life stages, okay? This is the age distribution across the US. That first hump on the left, these are the millennials, right? These are the millennials aging. This is why we talk about them as such a you know, big and impactful generation, because they're big, they're a big hill, right? Right here on this graph. That green line, that's where I try to read this is the median age of the first home buyer, that's 33. Okay, they're aging into 33, they're aging into buying homes. It took them a little bit longer than others, but here they come. Okay, and they're putting a lot of pressure on the home market in terms of steady demand. Okay, that other bubble that you see right there, or the, excuse me, the other hill that you see, those are the boomers, right? And then off to the right, that's silent gen. They're, I mean, you know, they're, they're dying, right? They're just, that's just how you interpret the graph. Okay. All right, but there are a lot of barriers to buying a home, right? There are a lot of barriers to buying a home. Home values are now more expensive than they've ever been nationally. You take me into one of those job centers, you take me to Seattle, you take me to San Francisco, you take me anywhere else, and home values are much higher than they've ever been, okay? I'm paying record high student loan debt, I'm paying record high rent payments. I gotta go to the bank of mom and dad in order to afford the down payment, okay? Now if we look at this graph here, blue lines are post-recession, green lines are pre-recession. It used to be the case that only 8% of first-time home buyers accepted a gift from mom and dad to swing that down payment, okay? Now a quarter, a quarter of first-time home buyers have to go to the bank of mom and dad. I benefited greatly from the bank of mom and dad and Uncle Randy, thank God for Uncle Randy, okay? It's just harder to swing. And again, I mentioned before, it's harder to swing because our rent burdens are higher than they've ever been. So if I look at the green line, this is the share out of median household income that I would expect to spend on median rent payment, market rate rent payment. And notice that it's just higher than it's ever been before. It steadily increases over time. Okay, if I look at the median, what the share out of the median household income I would expect to pay on a mortgage payment, that's the blue line. Okay, you can't really compare green to blue, because in blue I haven't put in property taxes, maintenance costs, anything like that, but you can make the historical comparison. Blue, mortgages are still far more affordable than they've ever been, despite the fact that home values are back beyond peak, because of interest rates. Right? Interest rates remain really low. This is another thing that's driving demand our way. Now, a lot of people worry, is it a bubble? Home values are higher than they've ever been, and they're moving really fast, right? Well, you know, a lot of this is interest rates remain low, and I'll... <laughs> I'll make the same prediction that all economists have made for the past, I don't know, three years. Mortgage rates are gonna go up. Or so we say, or so we think, or so think point to that. But in the meantime, while interest rates remain very low, it does put extra speed on at least demand towards the housing market, right? It benefits you uh, to, to have that mortgage, it's stable mortgage, low interest rates as opposed to renting. We also think that credit is nowhere near as available as it was during the bubble, right? We're about halfway, I think, in terms back to credit availability. Uh, if you look at, you know, the most ease that ever existed, uh, improper ease, really, during the height of the bubble, right? Too much credit, too freely, versus absolutely no credit in 2012. We're about halfway in between. So the hope here is that people who are getting mortgages will be able to maintain those mortgage payments. The hope is we're not going to see another foreclosure crisis, but something has to give, right? Why hasn't it given already? Why hasn't home values slowed down? We've got all that demand, and there's nothing to buy. Okay, this is the inventory that's available on average in any given day, 
right? And notice that it just steadily goes down and down and continues to go down and hasn't returned. Now, this is on average on any given day, so something listed at the beginning of the month might be gone by the end of the month. And that's particularly true if homes are selling very fast in a climate where there's a lot of, woo. I'm a gesturer. And I don't have a strong grip. <laughs> well, now these are going very, very fast, right? And the time on market is shortening and shortening and shortening. Okay, so here we see it continue to go down. Right? Now, inventory is even more constrained on the bottom and middle tier because that's not where we build, right? That's not where we build. Um, in the next graph, I'll also talk about how a lot of the single family homes are currently being rented, right? Those lower tier homes were converted over. So if I'm less, more constrained on that entry level housing, if I break homes into home value tiers, what I find is that homes are moving much, much faster for affordable homes. Right? This is even harder for that generation, that big you know, generation that's coming online and aging into buying, they're going to buy their entry level house. It's much less available, that's where the home pressure is. Okay? This, is the, this is the graph that I mentioned that more and more single family homes are rented now than they ever were before. Okay? This helps cut down on the first uh, excuse me, for, uh, entry level housing. And a lot of why there isn't homes in general is because we're just really not building. The green line is the new home sales, and it continues to be below pre recession, pre bubble era. The rate at which we build remains really low. Now you've got agents in the market helping consumers in the market. There's a lot of consumers, there's a lot of demand, especially in these uh, heavy job centers, and they're looking for housing, they're looking for homes. And probably what's the biggest impression upon all of them, and you may be intimately familiar with too, is this lack of inventory, right? It's coming through your MLS. New construction, even though there's not very money of it, if you're not connected to it, if you're not providing it, if you're not surfacing it, right? You've all these consumers who are really looking and searching. We found in a lot of our uh, research, we do a major, massive uh, survey every year called the Zillow Group Report. If you want to check out last year's version, you can go to zillowgroupreport.com. It's this you know, big, heavy book of consumer insights. The new version will come out in the coming weeks, I think, um, um, very soon, so updated numbers. But one of the things that we find in that is that the new construction buyer is not a sole new construction buyer. They come across new construction. Right? They don't head out one day and just say, like, hey, I know I'm a new construction buyer. No, they're searching for homes, and often they have to go that direction because of the lack of availability. Okay? So they're coming across it, sometimes haphazardly. You know, it's hard to surface. Okay. Now, this is just to make the point that what we do build does tend to be more expensive than it used to be in terms of higher price points. This is the median uh, sale price of existing homes. It's the blue guy versus the green guy. And that premium was pretty steady around 20% for a while. And then after the housing bubble bust, it started widening and widening. Now, that premium between new and existing homes is at 33%. This is even harder for the first time home buyer heading out, right? The lack of available inventory. Now the green line is the average square footage of new construction. The blue guy is the lot size. We're putting a bigger, bigger house on the same amount of lot, right? Because land prices are really high. We're not building, so what does it mean? Homes are getting older. Median age of homes was 15 years old. Home sales, homes that sold, median age of homes that sold was 15 years old. Now it's 28. Okay. Now, what does this mean for the new guys coming online? Well, new millennials coming online, getting older, lack of experience, right? Uh, first time home buyer, so you know, definitely lack of experience. They haven't really figured out yet that when you buy a really old home, sometimes it means a big hit to your paycheck a year later. Okay, so this is looking at the percentage homeowners making major repairs within that first year of owning a home by the age of construction. So homes built in 1950, almost 60% of homeowners paying out, right, for a huge major repair, right, versus new homes. And millennials are not as familiar with this concept, okay, when you're making that comparison, existing home versus new home sales. In a lack of inventory, you have to move fast, right? Agents are having to help people inform a decision that has to move quickly, okay? And there are a lot of, there are a lot of pitfalls, right? So I want to bring it back, okay? So the lack of inventory is really driving a lot of this market. When we think about, you know, is it a bubble? Well, a bubble would mean there's an imbalance that I can't, I can't point to fundamentals. I could totally point to fundamentals here. I can point to fundamentals. I got a good job market. Unemployment rate is very low, right? Economists think we're back at full employment. Wages have already started to move. I've got record number of job openings, right? Especially in higher end fields. I've got a lot of good demand side metrics. 
I've also got long-term demographics showing me that there's this massive generation coming online hitting ages for home buying, and yet I have nothing to sell them. Okay, I have a lack of inventory. So what does that mean in terms of our forecast? We'll expect things to slow down just because <laughs> a lot of the times when we make these forecasts, what comes up must come down, and our rates right now are not sustainable. And in the past, we've seen them follow by a tempering, right, by a slowing. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Our forecasts over the past two years have all lowballed what actually happened in a pretty serious way, okay? Because, A, it's hard to forecast things, okay? But, B, these markets are wild, right? We expected inventory to come back. We expected the shadow inventory of rented houses to come back, okay? We expected all these things to happen. New construction would pick up. It hasn't happened. This remains, you know, tight inventory remains our story. It just gets harder, and people are coming online ready to buy. So forecasted at 3.2% for the nation, I might even say, you know, this is going to be, it's going to be faster than that. Hopefully this fills you with confidence in terms of the housing market that's coming, right? In terms of all the people coming online ready to buy homes, all the people to serve, uh, and also hopefully elucidates where, uh, you know, where there's some needs, right? Where there's some tightness. Anyway, thank you so much for having me. It's totally a pleasure, and have a great night. <laughs>